Sidetrack episode 49, Satan and the Origin of Evil. Welcome back to A2Z History Presents, The History of the Papacy. The History of the Papacy podcast is a proud member of the Agora Podcast Network. We are a group of independent podcasters. Our goal is to create thought-provoking and high-quality podcasts. The Agora Podcast Network show of the month is Dominic Perry's History of Egypt podcast. Dominic is an Egyptian history scholar who creates a vivid retelling of the vast history of Egypt. Dominic begins in the earliest legendary times and plans to end in the times of the Romans. Egypt is endlessly fascinating, and so is this podcast, so definitely add it to your playlist. Learn more at agorapodcastnetwork.com. If you have ever thought of supporting the show, Patreon is a great way to do it. Different levels of support have unique rewards, so definitely check it out. Today, we welcome new Alexandria-level patron, Chris. I give you my sincerest thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And as usual, thank you to our Constantinople-level patrons, Regan, Sandy, Andy, Paul, and Dr. Jeff. I've included in the link in the show notes to my Amazon wish list. When you're checking out at Amazon and your cart just might feel a little bit light this time, and thinking about in the holiday season, you might be able to just get one more piece into that cart, think of adding one of the items from my wish list. It would be greatly appreciated. And one last thing before we move on, I'd like to thank PayPal donator Brett. All right, with all that out of the way, this is the fifth installment of Gary and Steve's Guide to the Apocalypse. In this episode, Gary and I will try to dig into the history and find out where Jewish and Christian ideas of evil came from, where did the idea of evil personified develop, and how did that idea develop in the different forms of Judaism operating in the Second Temple period. Thank you very much for listening, and enjoy the apocalypse. The end is nigh, after all. The apocalypse always seems to be shaded in evil, but what is the background in the text, history, and the tradition about evil and Satan? We'll fumble around and maybe even play with fire. Ooh, sounds spooky. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing it. Oh, I'll, I'll be in it. Oh. <laughs> and evil, where evil comes from, that's something that really isn't, compl- it isn't explained very well. And older Judaism, or even in really Greco-Roman paganism, it really, it's the Persians who have a really concrete reason why there's evil. Yes, they came up with a dualistic idea, didn't they? In the Old Testament, evil, in effect, comes from God. And the author of Jubilees found that a profoundly disquieting idea. And I suppose during the entire Hellenistic period, it it was considered to be, well, you know, how can God possibly let these things happen? So they came up with the idea of Satan, who is barely mentioned in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, Satan is simply the prosecuting attorney. He's not evil in any sense at all. In the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Jubilees is the first to construct a complex character, which it calls Mastema, or Mastema, who is clearly Satan and the source of all evil. Before we move on, this whole idea of the angels, like angels like Satan, who's a fallen angel, and the Watchers, that's such a bizarre concept that we we don't really talk that much about. These Watchers are angels who were... They were sent to teach men, but they fell into sin and then they had relations with humans and made the the giants. Like, how do they explain all this? Where are the giants now? And, you know, what happened to them? Were they actual giants? 
It's a weird thing, isn't it? I mean, giants are mentioned in the early parts of Genesis in a couple of throwaway lines. They're referred to as the Nephilim. I don't know how they got into Genesis, but they're just a few paragraphs. And But those few paragraphs or verses became incredibly influential. And people were asking exactly those questions. Well, who are these giants? Who are the Nephilim? Yeah, what exactly. What happened to them? And they expanded into a whole major theology whereby both in First Enoch and in Jubilees, the concept that angels mated with men and produced, oh, I suppose, hideous hybrids becomes quite a common concept. Actually, it's a lot like Tolkien as a sideline, because I think in Tolkien, the orcs are hideously degenerate elves or something, or the product of some... Yeah, I think that sounds familiar. Yeah, the product of some hideous mismating. Yeah, and it just seems like this whole thing, it almost... To me, it seems like they're trying to they're trying to explain maybe folk beliefs or holdovers from maybe a type of paganism, maybe that they're trying to explain away. I, I think you're quite right there. From my understanding, demons were quite a common concept in Canaan and the surrounding areas. And from what I remember, demons appear quite a lot in, say, Babylonian and Assyrian mythology. Mm-hmm. So the concept of these sort of sub-beings who do bad things was certainly around. But Old Testament Judaism had pretty much rejected that concept completely. As far as I know, there's only one demon referred to in the entire Old Testament, and that's Azazel, Azazel. And he only gets, again, it's just one little throwaway line. But ancient Judaism rejected demons completely. And in fact, it's one of the major distinctions between Judaism and all the other Canaanite religions. They rejected demons in favour of this very rigid monotheistic concept. There is a God. Maybe God has messengers, which ended up as the word angels, but even then they're a bit sort of, yeah, not sure about this. The book of Jubilees is full of angels. And in fact, the angel, uh, an angel called the angel of the presence, is the angel who dictates the book of Jubilees to Moses. And it constructs whole hierarchies of them. It doesn't name angels, so there's no sort of Gabriel or Michael named, but they are described by rank. So, you know, like um, the cherubim, seraphim, and uh, principalities and thrones, which the medievals came up with. They're all in Jubilees. The only angel in Jubilees who gets his own name is Mastema, also known as Satan. So it's interesting to me that Judaism, Old Testament Judaism, had rigidly rejected angels and demons and all that sort of stuff, but they cracked back in. Maybe it's a psychological need. And also, I suppose, uh, as you said, influence from Persian religions. I mean, everyone else believed in demons and angelic beings. So, And the difference between folk religion, what people are actually practicing and believing, and what's coming down from the temple scribes that's true that's very true actually i mean the old testament is replete with the temple establishment trying to swat out all the little local shrines where quite probably you know these demons were at least catered to if not worshipped so to be like i suppose modern folk beliefs a lot of churches have difficulty getting rid of you know weird superstitions and saying no no we don't actually believe that right it's just a story One thing about Jubilees, which again distinguishes it from Genesis, is that Jubilees sticks in a lot of legal stuff, uh, halakha, elaboration on biblical laws and rules, which doesn't appear in the Pentateuch. For example, when it's talking about Abraham, uh, Jubilees 21, Abraham is uh, talking to Ishmael, and Abraham decides to give a little lecture about women. And he says, and if any woman or maid commit fornication amongst you, burn her with fire and let them not commit fornication with her after their eyes and their heart. You just don't find that sort of stuff in Genesis. There are no legal rules embedded in Genesis. It's a big, happy narrative. And probably the insertion of all these rules into Jubilees is why Jubilees was eventually rejected by the Christians. Even though a lot of the church fathers thought it contained predictions of Jesus, They just couldn't really stomach all this Jewish legal stuff. They just thought, no, we we can't really do that. 
So we'll have to get rid of that book. Sorry, guys. The, at that point, was Judaism beginning to develop that concept of the law of a, other books that are an interpretation of what was said in the Pentateuch or Leviticus, etc.? Well, there are lots of laws in, in the Pentateuch, but they're in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So the, the laws are there, but they certainly weren't in Genesis or Exodus, for that matter, really, except for the Passover. So the insertion of all these laws into Jubilee's retelling of Genesis is a novelty. And the Christians just threw it out. And I would have to imagine that a, Christians at the time who are trying to convert pagans wouldn't and Gentiles wouldn't necessarily like the theme that the whole universe is for Jews only. No, that would not have gone down well at all. It, yeah, that's tough to explain. Yes, you'd have to do a lot of twisty, turny theological interpretation for that one. Not, of course, that that stopped other concepts. <laughs> so maybe if someone had thought really, really hard about it, they could have done it, but maybe it was just too hard. And I thought, no, nope, it's too clear. It says that the universe was created for Jews alone. No, we can't work our way around this one. And then the whole idea of this um, lunar versus solar calendar, is there any evidence in there? They must have had pretty sophisticated methods for observing. I suppose someone worked out that the solar year was around 360 days or whatever. Jubilees decided it was 364 days in the solar year because that's the only way you can get a nice even number and have seven times 52 50, exactly 52 weeks in the year. I'm not quite sure if they absolutely knew that the solar year was 365 and a quarter days long, or they thought, yes, it really is 364 days long. But it was certainly known. I, th I think the Mesopotamians or one of those civilizations had a pretty accurate solar calendar. Yeah, that could well be. And the Greeks may have come up with one too. Well, I don't know that much about ancient calendars. There certainly were a lot around. Uh, the lunar calendar, of course, is simply the worst if you want to keep track of things. And you have to keep inserting extra months or weeks or days. Just a mess. And even um, the solar calendar, if you don't have it worked out to that pretty close to 365 and a quarter, that gets messed up pretty quickly. Yes, exactly. I mean, if you adopted Jubilee's calendar 364, well, that's a whole day and a quarter. You're losing a year. So after a century or so, things are going to get pretty, pretty out of whack. Actually, I wonder how the author of Jubilee's would have um, coped with that, because he thought he was constructing the perfect calendar. And after a, after a full Jubilee, 49 or 50 years, you're talking that it's close to 75 days yeah, it's out of whack. Out of whack? That's a big deal. That, a that is a big deal. I don't think Jubilees copes with that at all. He just assumes that the year is 364 days long. Oh, it would have so upset him. He would have been absolutely panic-stricken, I think, if he'd if he thought that, because he's come up with this perfect theological concept of 364 days. And then if he, if he, if he actually survived his own calendar and lived into old age, he'd be going, hmm, it's meant to be winter now. Yeah, and it's... The, my calendar's two and a half months off. That's right. Okay, guys, I know that we're having the harvest festival in the coldest time of the year when we don't have a harvest, but yeah. And it doesn't make sense. It really does. It seems to be that they were trying to find the perfect theological year and ignoring that the fact that I'm pretty sure by that point other civilizations had pretty good solar calendars that didn't fed into exactly 52 seven-day weeks. No, I suppose the Jews are the ones which had the seven-day week, didn't they? So if, if you're going to come up with a perfect solar Jewish calendar, you have to take into account this seven-day thing. Uh, apparently that's one of the inspirations for the solar calendar in Jubilees. The fact that the Sabbath falls on the Sabbath every single time in, in, you know, over the course of a week. It never moves you know, to Monday or Tuesday or something. And he wanted to do that for every single other religious date in the year. Hey, if, if the Sabbath occurs regularly every seven days, well, shouldn't everything else occur regularly? That, that seems to be the motivation behind it. 
And as we see with the dating of Easter, that's just not an easy thing to dictate. Well, it's an impossible thing to dictate. <laughs> and under the current system, yes. And we've really, we've come to the end with apocalypses, but a couple of things we can wrap up with, with apocalypses is this whole idea of evil and evil being defined and evil being personified starts to come out of this. Yes, we see this really for the first time in Jubilees. Not so much in Enoch. Enoch, first Enoch is full of angels, but it doesn't really have a master evil genius. Jubilees is the book which creates the world's first supervillain, Satan, known as Mastema, at the head of the anti-angels, demons, I suppose, the devils. That's, this is the first time we see this concept come through. And it percolated through all Judaism very slowly. It was eventually rejected centuries later. But certainly in the period we're talking about, from Maccabean, Hellenistic to early Christian times, most people would have believed in an active evil presence in the world, which, as you said, well, I suppose its ultimate origin is probably Persian dualism. Yeah, it really is. That's trying to fit those two concepts together, that God is the ultimate authority. But how do you explain that this evil is out there? You can't go the full dualism route saying that there's a counterbalance. There's light and dark, good and evil, and they balance each other out. You can't say that, or that negates the whole idea of a, a um, transcendent monotheistic God. Yes. Basically, Jubilees inserts Satan into all the tough-to-explain and unpleasant incidents in the Bible. For example, when Abraham is about to sacrifice Isaac in the Old Testament, of course, it is God who has said, you know, go and kill your own son and then rescues Isaac at the last minute. The author of Jubilees says, no, that's impossible. How could God have, you know, tried to do that? So he inserts Satan into that incident and says it was Satan making Abraham sacrifice Isaac. Or another example, there's a very strange incident in Exodus chapter 4 where God tries to kill Moses. Absolutely inexplicable. It just, it's just a little paragraph couple of verses where God tries to kill Moses. No one's ever really been able to explain it. What on earth is going on? But the author of Jubilees explains it. He says, ah, this is Satan actually trying to kill Moses. So the author of Jubilees creates this figure to explain all the nasty little things throughout the Old Testament, which are very hard to oh, stomach, I suppose, if you believe in an all knowing, beneficent, good God. But when, when you have Satan doing all these things, easy, easy solution. And then it gets even more complicated to explain when in the, in the gospel narratives that God's tempting, or that the devil's tempting Jesus. If Jesus is fully God, how does he possibly really get tempted? That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. And there's different explanations to that that, um, you know, in future episodes we'll be able to ex we'll talk about further. But that's a big one that I think that's an instant one that makes you think that how can how can there be temptation like that when, in fact, how could God actually be tempted? Yes, he should be utterly untemptable. Well, I suppose that's the human divinity fusion thing happening. But actually, that incident would, would have fitted perfectly into Jubilees. That, that's how Jubilees would have written it, as Satan tempting Jesus. That comes straight from the tradition, the literary tradition exemplified by Jubilees. And that, to me, just um, in all these episodes and how I'm you know, talking about this for reading about it and then talking about it for several hours, that... These books that even though they really truly are apocrypha, they're hidden and that they're they've dropped all sorts of little seeds all throughout the history of Christianity and Judaism that are sprouting up. But aren't we don't really necessarily know where they came from. 
and a good a good example of that is actually in the New Testament itself, where those sections that we were talking about about Jesus being tempted by by an evil force or uh, traditionally believed Satan, that just there's no like even as a literary concept. The person doing the tempting in those passages in Mark, et cetera, that character is not even introduced. You get the feeling that the the character of the evil one or Satan or whatever you want to call it, it's just assumed that the reader knows where that character is coming from. Yes, there's no origin story in the New Testament, is there? Uh, but in fact, Satan would have been a, a common concept at the time, just just like he is now. You don't have to explain him. Everyone knows, you know, even vaguely about Satan. Although maybe a lot of people just thought he was the bogeyman or something like that. Yeah, but it says a lot that it's just in the in the narrative sense that it was felt that he needed no explanation. Whereas the background story of John the Baptist was detailed pretty closely. And the, I mean, look at the background story of Jesus. They go through the 49 generations back to Abraham. So they felt that they needed to settle that up, but not that the issue of Satan. That's that to me says a lot. That's a very good point. Yes, they had to um, set up this whole origin story for Jesus, explain all these sort of things. So obviously the writers of the Gospels felt here is something our audience may not know, whereas yeah, Satan, well, everyone knows that. We don't have to explain it. Yeah, I mean, when it boils down to it, those really aren't their narratives meant to share with other people. Now, to me, it seems like when it was, as it went back down to Romans who maybe Romans and Greeks who didn't know have that concept necessarily. That must have been a confusing point for them. Actually, that's a good point. The pagans didn't have a concept of an all-powerful evil character, did they? All their gods were bastards. Yeah, I mean, like if you take uh, Hades or Pluto, he was a bastard, like you said. But yeah, I just think it's very interesting that this whole concept of evil and it really doesn't play out in rabbinical judaism to at any level as it does in christianity yes not at any level uh, judaism reverted to a very strict monotheism got rid of all the demons got rid of evil as a personification on the other hand christianity embraced them revelation is a strange and intriguing text where you read it And it doesn't make sense. Then you read it again, and it really doesn't make sense. (laughs) You read some commentary about it, and it makes a little sense, but not really. Hopefully, we can make some sense about it, but then again, maybe not. And we'll hope you listen to it next time as we make some sense or not when we talk about Revelation.